This lesson deals with the natural response of a series RLC circuit. You can find these notes in the ECE 201 ebook in chapter 7 starting on page 33. What we're going to be doing in this part of the course is take a look at the response of a series RLC circuit. And we're going to separate out the natural response from the force response. So suppose I have a circuit that has only one inductance and one capacitance, and that I have no independent sources, and a switch, and that the switch changes state at t equals zero. I'm going to thevenize that part of the circuit, and so all I have really is just a theven and resistance since I have no independent sources. But I do have two initial conditions, and that would be the current in this inductance and the voltage across the capacitance. Now let's solve for the current in this loop. Going around this direction, so I'll assign a drop with a passive sign convention. The rise in voltage equals the drops. The drop in voltage would be the current I times R thevenin plus the drop across the inductance, which is L D I D T, and then the drop across the capacitance, which is one over C, integral of I, in this case DX, and then we'll do the integration from zero to T. We also have the initial condition added into the integral. Now there are no rises in voltage, so we'll set this equal to zero. Now let's differentiate both sides of the equation. And since uh, R thevenin is not a function of time, we'll just get R thevenin times D I D T. Same here for the inductance, it's not a function of time, so it's the second derivative of i with respect to t. And then when you differentiate an integral, you just get the argument, so it'll be one over c, and then just be i, or the i of t. And then the derivative of a constant is just zero. Let's rearrange the terms here from the highest derivative to the lowest. Let's also divide through by l. So if I divide through by l, I just have this second derivative of i with respect to t, and then dividing through by l over here for the first derivative, r thevenin over L, di dt, and then lastly dividing here by L times uh, i. Now as we did in the last example, it's not possible to find the solution to this differential equation just by integration or differentiation, so we're going to have to try to take a guess at the form of the solution. Now we'd seen before that our first order differential equations had a solution with an exponential as part of it. So let's maybe just try there, and we'll just assign a constant a and s, and then see if this works as a possible solution. So let's plug it back into this equation that we just derived for this series current. So we're going to take the first term here, which is 1 over LC times our solution, which would be a e to the st. Here we've got r thevenin over L, and then we're going to take the first derivative of this, which is going to be equal to a times s e to the st. And then I've got the second derivative of this, which is going to again be a and then the derivative of this is going to be s e to the st, so I'm going to get an s squared here. Now what's common to each one of these terms is a e to the st, so let's pull that out. And what I'm left with then is s squared, r thevenin over l times s, and then 1 over lc. Now again, all this has to be equal to 0. Now since this is not identically 0, that means that this must be equal to 0. So let's set this equal to 0. So I've got the term s squared, r thevenin over l times s plus 1 over lc. This is also called the characteristic equation of our differential equation. But this is the form of a second order equation, and so there actually are two roots that satisfy this equation, and we can use the quadratic formula. And that's equal to minus this term, which is r theta over l, plus or minus the square root of this term squared, minus four times this coefficient, which is one, times this coefficient, which is one over lc. And then we divide by twice the coefficient that's multiplying s squared. That would just be 2 times 1. We also have the negative root of that, too. So we have two possible roots for that equation. In other words, two possible values of s that can make that equation go to 0. So there's some factoring here. I brought the 2 up into the numerator, so I've got a 2 here. Bring this inside the square root as a 4, and that cancels the 4 here. But then putting it back in here, it would become a 2 again. We have two possible values of s that make the characteristic equation go to zero. What this means is that solution then is i is equal to a e to the s 1 t, and if we plug that into this equation, we'll get zero as a result. But also it means that if we use a e to the s 2 t, we'll also have this equation go to zero. It means that there's two different answers to the same problem. Now when we build a circuit, it does the same thing day in and day out, so this can't be the solution of that differential equation. Let's take another guess if we can. Maybe it's some combination of these two. Probably the simplest thing to do is to add them together. Let's uh, use two different constants here, a1 and a2, because we really have two initial conditions to satisfy. Well, let's plug this into our differential equation. So I'm going to need the first derivative and the second derivative. So the first derivative is going to give me s1 e to the s1t times a1, and then s2 e to the s2t times a2. Second derivative, we'll get another s1. 
and we'll get another S2. Let's put this all together. The first term was the second derivative of i. It's this term right here. And then we had r7 and over l times the first derivative, which is here, and then 1 over lc times our function i of t. That should equal 0 if this is a solution. Let's factor out again all the terms that are common here. There's two things that, that are popping up. It's a1e to the s1t. So let's pull that out of this term, and we're left with an s1 squared. We pull also a2e to the s2t out. We have an s2 squared term here. And then do this again. We get r7 and over l times s1 and we get r7 and over l times s2. And then over here, we get 1 over lc, and then pulling this term out here, we get 1 over lc again. And of course, this has to equal 0. Just shown that the roots of this equation is 0 for the value of s1 and for the value of s2. So it makes this term here multiply this, which is then 0 times this plus 0 times this. And that is equal to 0. So that is the form of our solution. I of t looks like some a1, e to the s1t plus a2 e to the s2t. Well, let's write s1 and s2 in terms of two constants. We'll call them alpha and omega naught. Pairing this to our proposed solution, alpha is equal to r7 and over 2l, and omega 0 is equal to 1 over the square root of lc. We use this form of solution for, for other uh, in order differential equations. The term alpha is called uh, Napier frequency, named after John Napier, a 16th century mathematician and physicist. And omega naught is called the resonant radian frequency. And the units here will be radians per second. Now there are three possibilities with S1 and S2. We have that this term is real. So we wind up getting two distinct roots that are real. This is called the overdamp response. And this would occur when alpha squared is greater than omega naught squared. Or really just alpha is greater than omega naught. We could have alpha equal omega naught. And again, we'd have two roots, S1 and S2, but they would actually be the same and be real. This is called a critically damped response. The last case is that, that alpha is less than omega naught. What this implies is that we have the square root of a negative number. Take a look at that in the following sections. That's actually called the underdamped response. Let's take an example with our, our L and C and no independent sources. Suppose that L is equal to 50 millihenries and C is 0.2 microfarads. Let's figure out the range of values for R thevenin to be overdamped, critically damped, or underdamped. Omega naught is 1 over the square root of LC, so that's 1 over the square root of 50 millihenries times 0.2 microfarads. It turns out to be 10,000 radians per second. Alpha is R thevenin over 2L. We're going to determine R thevenin shortly, and then L is 50 millihenries, so the reciprocal of this is 10 times R thevenin, and that also has units of radians per second. To be overdamped, we need alpha to be greater than omega naught. In other words, 10 r thevenin needs to be greater than 10,000. r thevenin would be greater than 1,000. For the critically damped case, we have alpha equal omega naught, and that means that r thevenin would equal 1,000. And lastly, for the underdamped case, where alpha is less than omega naught, that would imply that r thevenin is less than 1k. And this is the form of the natural response of a series RLC circuit.